Welcome back to Crystal Clear! I'm Ashrik Vox, and the episode Reunited is already a year old, recently celebrating its first anniversary. So I thought it would be great with 365 day hindsight to revisit this episode and give it a breakdown, since we weren't doing episode breakdowns at the time of its premiere. Not just go through some easter eggs and references, but provide some behind the scenes knowledge on the episode, since we've had a surplus of information arise since from the Steven Universe podcast and also give you guys a look at what the Battle of Yellow Diamond actually looked like. Now, because I am breaking down a relatively old episode, it'd mean a lot if you guys could give support so it can fare in the algorithm. So if we can get this breakdown to 3,000, 4,000 likes, it would mean a lot. I know we've been asking a lot lately, and again, you can just wait till you finish watching the video to figure out if you actually enjoyed it and if it's worthy of your like. And before we dive in, we have a word from our sponsor. I want to give a special thanks to The Ridge for sponsoring this episode. I've gone through many wallets in my time since middle school. They all have fallen apart, being stuffed with so many cards, receipts, and a bunch of other things I don't even need. It makes my whole body unbalanced. This is where The Ridge wallet is a lifesaver. Their motto, carry less, live more, is embodied in this minimalistic front pocket wallet designed to streamline what you carry in your wallet. Fitting up to 15 cards, you should be able to carry everything you need on a day-to-day -day basis. I definitely feel like this comes in handy for traveling, hiking, vacations, you name it. The Ridge wallet comes in titanium, carbon fiber, aluminum, and over a dozen different styles and colors. They also have other products, such as a power bank, i.e. portable charger, which is the lightest charger I've ever used. I seriously cannot recommend this enough. Get 10% off today with free worldwide shipping by going to ridge.com roundtable and use our promo code roundtable or click the link in the description. Once you snag one, feel free to send us a picture with it. The Ridge Wallet. Carry less, live more. Now, the episode titled Reunited is representative of three different plot points. The reunion of Ruby and Sapphire as Garnet, Peridot and Lapis, and the Diamonds reuniting with Pink through Steven. The opening musical number for Just One Day Let's Only Think About Love is jam-packed with callbacks and easter eggs to the series past. This episode is the beginning of the climax for the original story outline of Steven Universe, so it makes sense they would set the stage with a reflection of the series. Steven is shaving his one strand of facial hair that surfaced at the end of the episode Steven's birthday, using the razor Garnet gave him as a present in the flashback found in Three Gems and a Baby. Her future vision paid off. As the tempo of the song kicks off, Steven strikes the same pose from the beginning of the first opening. The wedding cake is actually a together breakfast, with Ruby and Sapphire figurines on top. Steven, Greg, and Pearl's tuxes are from Mr. Greg, but this time Amethyst joins in on the fun. Connie's dress is identical to what she wore in Alone Together, and we need to talk. Ruby and Sapphire avoiding eye contact with each other plays into the idea that you're not supposed to see your spouse at all on your wedding day until you see them walking down the aisle in their beautiful dress, or else bad luck will come your way. Though considering the events of these episodes, the bad luck kinda came regardless. Business armor could be material she wore in the gem war, as she remarks it's the nicest thing she owns, leaving it behind in her forge when she was bubbled by Rose Quartz. Although it's possible the armor in question is actually her own projection. Peridot's yellow dress and Garnet's wedding dress that appears later on was remarked to be gem clothing by Rebecca Sugar on the Steve Universe podcast, and how they are figuring out the logistics of gem clothing while developing the episode. Would it rip in battle or dissipate into light? According to Sugar and Ian Jones Cordy, the episode originally did not open with a song. Originally, the episode opened with Steven banking on a vending machine, trying to get some chaps out, which would mirror the diamond ships banging on the Earth's surface to get the cluster to emerge. They added the opening number later on to the process to refresh the audience on plot points that will come into play in the episode, like Lapis and the cluster. The song also served to see where everyone's heads are at after all the crazy events over the season. Pearl feels a lot of regret over withholding information about Pink Diamond being Rose Quartz, even though it was against her will. Amethyst has conflicting feelings over Rose, unsure even the type of flower she picked out for the wedding. Peridot is caught up in anxiety over Lapis' departure, and the odds of the diamonds invading the planet in order to finally obtain the cluster. 
When it comes to the influences for the song, Sugar was paying attention to old Judy Garland musicals, particularly For Me and My Gal, which is wedding driven. Sugar enjoyed how in these old musicals, people sing and then talk. Carrying this idea to the episode itself, it was a bit hard to coordinate, as they would loop over bits of Ivy and Shirazu's score to characters talking, before jumping back into song. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum was another big influence, alongside Flitler on the roof which this episode serves a homage to, since that contains a scene where a wedding leads directly to the significant violence of the film. Speaking of significance, Ruby appearing in the wedding dress as opposed to Sapphire speaks volumes. It goes into censorship in other countries, how some dubs of Steven Universe refer to Ruby with he, him pronouns. Rebecca Sugar had to fight for the wedding in general. It almost got to the point where she was ready to pack her bags and take her show elsewhere, but more on that later. Ultimately, with Ruby being in the dress, it would look a bit silly to call Ruby he him, because the kind of territories that would censor Ruby's identity would also try to alter the idea of a man wearing a feminine outfit. For those trying to undermine the message of Steve Universe, they end up in a lose-lose situation. There's also the neat little detail of Ruby's firepower seeping out as she gets more and more excited at the thought of marrying the love of her life. To contrast, Sapphire shatters the eyes forming around her feet from anxiety. This is a reference to the common symptom of a soon-to-be spouse known as cold feet. Running through the faces of the wedding attendees, the different experiences the citizens and associates of Beach City half of the gems is illustrated through their reactions. Sadie, Barb, the Fryman family are happy to see such a momentous occasion, whereas people like Doug and Priyanka are a bit confused, but still supportive. They're still learning about the gems and who they are as people, and not who they are as intergalactic war criminals who could harm their child. Notice how Nana Falls guards are also in attendance, while Lars's parents and suitcase Sam are absent. Uncle Andy is also present with no voiceover, but his presence shows how his support towards the gems has grown substantially since he first met them back in Gem Harvest. Lion is briefly seen swallowing a blue iguana-like creature, which is a callback to an identical creature Lion swallowed in Lion 2 the movie, and then coughed up in Lion 4 alternate ending. While Ruby and Sapphire's wedding vows to each other are touching, it has a deeper meaning in Rebecca Sugar finally being able to tell the story, and the journey the relationship had behind the scenes. Ruby and Sapphire were created as a classic cartoon couple, who would go through various romantic tropes and situations any other couple in a different show would go through. Ruby and Sapphire's introduction in Jailbreak saw higher up at Cartoon Network forbid the two characters from ever becoming a romantic couple, but Rebecca Sugar argued, they already are. That's the point of Stronger Than You. Sugar drew the characters getting married for the first time in 2014. She began to pitch the wedding in either late 2015 or early 2016. Originally, Garnet marrying herself was a simpler, self-contained episode titled If You Love Yourself So Much, with Garnet dancing with herself and putting rings on her own fingers. Later, when the fight for this episode began, Sugar brought back the designs from the aforementioned early sketches, revised to include the flowers Ruby was wearing in her hair. The specific flowers in question? Hydrangeas was inspiration taken from her friend's wedding. Now a sneakier callback is during Sapphire's vows, where the background briefly shifts to the exterior shots of space from the end of the episode bubbled. Ruby and Sapphire kiss mouth to mouth for the first time on screen, and they refuse back into Garnet. Now Garnet's wedding outfit went through many design changes, including some ideas to have her fighting with a torn wedding dress. But gem clothing doesn't tear exactly, which again brought back the discussion, what would happen if gem clothing is torn? Would it dissipate into light? Will there be sparkles? Sugar really loved the asymmetrical dress situation that was also born out of necessity. It allowed Garnet's different clothing elements to show, and conveyed well as a battle outfit. When we look at the exterior shot of the outdoor wedding reception, we can see Nanafau dancing with her guards, Dewey trying to put the moves on Pearl, Sadie and Connie having some girl time, Jamie admiring Garnet from afar, Ronaldo wearing the same armor from Keep Beach City Weird is conversing with Bismuth, and they elaborated on the Steve Universe podcast that Ronaldo was actually mansplaining armor to Bismuth. Just imagine how that conversation went. Yes, yeah, so in Koala Princess, this armor was impervious to any sort of heat and fire. I'm pretty much the walking human torch. Uh, sir, your armor is made out of plastic. It's not about the material on the outside, it's about the material on the inside. 
the material of friendship, the true power. Sour Cream's DJing of the wedding calls back to the same setup he used in previous episodes with an identical shot of him tuning. Game Boys are actually used as a device for chiptune music. Jamie's feelings and rejection from Garnet, alongside Dewey seeing his lost agents moved on and happy serving Nanafwile, causes the two to share one big sad dance of pity, which interrupts all the dads plus Andy sharing a conversation. Pearl is chatting it up with Kiki, a friendship that formed in Letters to Lars. Parada is disturbed by Onion, possibly suspecting he's not a normal human being, if he's human at all. <laughs> Steven's empathy powers work as Spidey senses once more, as his connection to Blue Diamond causes him to shed massive, excessive tears, correlating with the arrival of the diamonds, shifting the color palette from colorful and vibrant to muted and bleak, highlighting only yellows and blues. Steven remarks to Nanafwile that we have a code blue and a code yellow, tidying into letters to Lars, where Nanafwile is seen planning with the gems and a few townies on what to do in case of a homeworld invasion. That plan unfolding in this moment, as that entire scene was to set up this episode. Although, what exactly is the difference between a code blue and a code yellow? Does it have to do anything with her powers or behavioral patterns? Like, yeah, Blue Diamond's here, she just cries a lot, so you guys may just want to hide and fish chew pizza. But if yellow is here, book it! Just run, man! The cluster suddenly being brought back after a lack of attention is described as by Sugar to be the result of a lot of moving parts. They knew what the outcome would look like but they needed to put the pieces together. The idea of Steven befriending the cluster first sparked in 2014 or 2015. They felt it was necessary for Steven to befriend the cluster so it could help him in this moment. The Cruniverse always planned for the cluster to arm wrestle Yellow Diamond's ship. Reunited in itself was in the making for a very long time, but the idea of the cluster fighting an armed ship came up when they first started planning the cluster arc, which had to be in 2014. The crew purposely introduced Yellow and Blue Diamond ships early on in the previous season as a result. When Blue Diamond arrives on the involuntary battlefield, Greg remarks that it's time to work the old universe charm, a nod to the fact Greg has captured the attention of two diamonds, Pink Diamond as Rose Quartz, falling in love, and Blue Diamond, who saw Greg as a unique enough specimen to be brought to the zoo, which is also a huge gag in the Steve Universe fandom. Everyone shuts down the notion of him approaching Blue Diamond, although that would have been super interesting, considering she was likely unaware he escaped the zoo. Maybe we will explore that here on the channel in Steve Universe Rewritten. Check out the first episode if you haven't. Bismuth calls out to the team, Come on, you rots! Let's put her in a bubble! Which reflects her own growth from her debut, going from a radical extreme crystal gem who would shatter a diamond on sight to someone who will fight but ultimately aims to just bubble and detain an opponent, giving them a chance rather than deciding their fate. On that note, Bismuth's weapon enhancements for Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl return. The gems no longer hold a weird, conflicted view towards the things Bismuth made for them, which leads to the underwhelming return of Alexandrite. Alexandrite's color palette has altered since her previous previous appearance in Super Watermelon Island, likely due to Amethyst's reformation in Crack the Whip and Garnet's wedding attire. Although really, I guess it would be everyone's wedding attire, since Pearl and Amethyst are wearing tuxedos. Blue Diamond's aura engulfs the crystal gems in grief. For a full breakdown of all the diamond's powers, check out our most recent update of the power of the diamonds. Connie comes to the rescue of Rose's sword, which Blue Diamond catches and recognizes as Rose Quartz's murder weapon just as she did in the trial, shattering not only the sword, but the illusion of Rose Quartz. Garnet faces her fears and confronts Blue Diamond head on, as a redition of Stronger Than You rocks on. Garnet's fear of Blue Diamond and Steven's dream set up this moment, giving us payoff and growth to the number one fusion. Blue Diamond manages to recognize Ruby and Sapphire as the gems who disrupted her court thousands of years ago, likely because their fusion cost Homeworld a chance to end the rebellion. Blue Diamond believes Garnet is simply desperate to win, but Garnet reveals she was simply stalling per Future Vision's request, allowing for the entrance of Lapis Lazuli. Steven suggested and can't go back that Lapis drops the bar in the beach, and she does it, just also on Blue Diamond's head. Lapis throwing the barn on Blue Diamond thematically has Lapis break the wall she set up between her and the Crystal Gems, the outside world. No longer deciding to run, she fully embraces the Earth and everything it has to offer, alongside the duty of protecting it. It's also a direct callback to the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> oh, rubbish! You have no power here! Be gone! Before somebody drops the house on you, you...
Lapis dropping the barn on Blue Diamond was planned far in advance, and it's the entire reason Lapis stole the barn in the first place, which organically worked into Lapis' own arc. Lapis facing off against Blue Diamond was also another story beat planned years ahead of time. Concept art depicting such an event goes all the way back to 2015. This is the culmination of Lapis' growth. As the gem who has had the least help from Steven, due to constantly pushing him away throughout the show, this torment only made her stronger. To the point where she's the only gem unaffected by Blue Diamond's powers, she's able to overcome it. Sugar compared Blue Diamond and Lapis to parental abandonment. Having Lapis throw the barn at Blue was cathartic for her. The diamonds don't take care of the lives they bring into the world. It's part of the problem with their system. As for Lapis, her internal conflict was having to take a side, thinking that she was manipulated by everyone. Now she's begun to make choices and has control over her life. Lapis was always afraid she'd do something horrible with power if she has it, but here she uses the power bestowed to her for good use, defending the earth and everything on it worth protecting. Steven's line, this is our home, our planet, our friends and family, we are the Crystal Gems, parallels a recognizable moment from the return. But this is my home, and you're all my family. I'm a Crystal Gem too. Sugar believes the fight between the Crystal Gems and Blue Diamond couldn't have happened at any point earlier in the series. It was only now, after being recently united by the events of the season. It ties in the business questions in a previous episode, Made of Honor. What do the Crystal Gems stand for now, with the information that they were founded on something that doesn't feel right to fight for anymore? Well, they have to stand with Steven, and he has to be confident to lead them in the right direction. The Crystal Gems know that they can trust each other, no matter what they originally founded on. They could not have fought the Diamonds as the team they are today, before they went through all of this together. Alright, now we really get into the battles, and I'm excited. Everyone springing into action with their weapons, having being launched into the air by Lapis, is reminiscent of a similar shot in the theme song. The barrage of attacks from the Crystal Gems see Bismuth, Pearl, and Amethyst have no effect on Blue Diamond. Lion's concussive roar faces her, potentially due to his power and strength stemming from another diamond, Pink Diamond. Garnet, the fusion and guest of honor, breaks her guard, while Steven, again, power stemming from a diamond, phases her enough with his spiked bubble to bring her down to her feet. The cluster defeats Yellow Diamond's ship in arm wrestling, the collateral damage of which crushes Blue Diamond of her own ship and destroys a part of Steven's house, allowing reconstruction to make room for Peridot, Lapis, and Bismuth, perhaps? Peridot confronts Yellow Diamond, asking if the tyrant remembers her from message received, to which Yellow Diamond plays it off with a simple, no, poofing Peridot, although I believe she likely did remember Peridot, but didn't want to give Peridot the satisfaction of getting angry over it again. There's really significance behind Yellow Diamond being the one responsible for poofing Peridot and Lapis, as she was always viewed as the first big bad, main antagonist of the series. Blue Diamond had a presence, but it was never to the degree of Yellow. In the Mindscape, we have a few more callbacks. Connie's scene plays as she panics in thought over Steven's unconscious body. Steven tells Garnet she's made of love, a direct reference to Stronger Than You. Pearl tells herself, I do it for her, I do it for him, which calls back to do it for her, do it for him in the episode Sworn to the Sword, although Steven reminds her to not forget about herself. Garnet begins punching rapidly and grunting, a visual reference to JoJo's Bizarre Adventures. She even makes the same noises as the attack. <laughs> Now, the Crystal Gems are able to hold their own against yellow and blue, which, uh, <laughs> shouldn't happen, so let's talk strategy. For Blue to not incapacitate the gems after Lapis is poofed implies she's not using her radiated pathokinesis. Perhaps being crushed by her ship actually did bring some damage, or she could only use it for so long in one instant. Either way, she's assumably weakened, only firing her projectiles at the gems. While we can't see the battle directly in the show, we can visualize it and get a good idea of what's happening. I think Amethyst may be taking care of Blue Diamond's projectiles with her whip, as it's a long-range weapon, swiping at each one as it gets close to the gems. The idea of Yellow not proofing everyone for destabilizing energy is, uh, questionable, as she does so and together alone effortlessly. So perhaps while she's firing, Pearl meets each blast with her own from her trident. So because these projectiles are voided, the diamonds would be momentarily left open, 
leaving Garnet and Bismuth to strike while the diamonds are vulnerable. Too little result. Now, Lion could be accompanying Connie in her mission to protect Steven's body, or he could also be out there, momentarily sunning yellow and blue with his concussive roars. Either way, this would have little result as the diamonds weren't even phased in the mindscape, whereas the crystal gems were. Yellow does have a bit of remorse, however, thinking to herself, I knew Pink couldn't handle her own colony, but I gave in. And now, I'm to blame for her fate. Implying that after Pink's tantrum in Jungle Moon, Yellow gave in to Pink Diamond's demands and was ultimately the one responsible for signing off on a colony. Steven uses his aura, the aura Pink Diamond, to appease to Yellow and Blue, and the episode comes to a close. Bringing Steven's saga with his powers full circle with the very first episode, Gem Glow. It's a gem glow of a different kind that ends up saving the day. Whereas Steven struggled to have his gem glow in the first episode, he's able to trigger it perfectly in the moment, saving the lives of every crystal gem and probably the Earth as a whole. And there you have it, a revisit of Reunited. What do you guys think? Does the episode still hold up to you? Does anything stick out rewatching it? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below or tweet your thoughts at RoundtableVids. And for more of my own thoughts, you can find me at AltricVox. We're also on Instagram. Special thanks to Art with Coda for creating an awesome thumbnail. For more of his wonderful art, you can find him on Tumblr and Instagram at Art with Coda and subscribe to his YouTube channel. Link down below in the description. Help the rental girl by either becoming a member of this channel or supporting us over at Patreon. Link in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please order a like and subscribe to the Roundtable for more great cartoon content. Thank you for watching and I hope you have an awesome day. Ostrich Vox, signing out.